Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to VCCA's Fireplace Series. This is episode 21. Um, I'm your host, Q, and I'm really excited to be here tonight because I love VCCA and everything they do for so many talented, creative people. And, um, and this is my second hosting, and, um, and we have a couple of awesome people that we're going to talk to about their creative work and how they met and all kinds of things. We're just going to have a lot of fun. Uh, so tonight, you all are going to meet uh, Catherine Fahey and also Maggie Smith. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, Catherine, and then I'm going to turn it over to her to, uh, to keep things going. Catherine uh, Fahey is a multidisciplinary artist who combines the crafts of storytelling, paper cutting, and shadow puppetry. Her pieces are either based on stories or songs. Some of Catherine's work is based on folk tales as far reaching as the southern swamps of Louisiana to the northern reaches of Inuit Quebec. Others are personal stories from her childhood in Virginia and the streets of her longtime home in Baltimore. Catherine's work is usually in the form of a cranky, a bygone form of visual performance involving a cranked scroll of artwork in a box. Her crankies have in the past been shared live in darkened space, which creates a warm feeling of sitting around the fireside. For the past year, however, Catherine has been exploring teaching and performing online so she can continue sharing work during the pandemic. Over the summer, her partner Dan Van Allen converted their Volkswagen bus into a rolling stage so that they could bring their shows to parks and sidewalks around Baltimore City. So without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce uh, to you, Catherine Fahey. Hi, thanks, Q. I checked out your music. It's really beautiful. Um, so good to be here with the VCCA family, and especially Maggie, who I made such a strong connection with at VCCA. Um, so basically, like Q said, I make these sort of shadow puppet shows in a box. And that's what I was working on last time I was there at VCCA. And I've got a little one that I made this year and that I wanna share a video with you guys. So you'll see what that final product looks like. And then I can kind of explain a little more how I make them. Gratitude is when memory is stored in the heart and not in the mind. Lionel Hampton. Today, I am grateful for our home. For a good night's sleep. For a hot bath. our cat. I'm grateful for a warm sweater on a cold day. For the flowers you bring home from the garden. For cups of tea together and sometimes with friends. Watching you sew buttons back on your clothes.
clean laundry. I'm grateful for trees. The trips we take in your Volkswagen bus. The outdoor flea market where we look together and wonder at all of the amazing things humans are capable of creating. Picnics by the water. Things that fly. Feathers. Totally silent herons. Luna moths that hide on the backs of trees. Foraging for mushrooms. Praying mantises. Praying foxes. The temporary nature of things. New life. Going home. But the thing I'm most grateful for is another day with you. Thanks. So you can kind of see what I what I've been working on recently. Um, that piece was made during COVID quarantine, and one of the things my partner Dan and I would do is every night tell each other things we were grateful for, and that would kind of get us focused on the positive, and you know carry us through sometimes. And so I made that cranky dedicated to my partner, Dan. Um, so, and this is a good example of 
so you can see how a cranky works. Um, my bigger one has like actual cranks on top, um, but this one I just put clothes pins on here. And you can see the back, how it's just a scroll and it, the scroll cranks across. Um, and then basically everything, all the images you see are cut out of either paper like this, just kind of thin paper cuts I glue on the scroll, or they can be shadow puppets and um, they can be simple like this kind of thing that's just one piece or like the cat in there that is trying to pop bubbles. He has a little more, get him in front of the camera. He has like some more moving parts. Um, and when they appear behind the screen, you know, they show through backlit. Um, so usually the pieces are stories or sometimes they're based on storytelling songs like ballads and the puppets can be very small or some of them are larger like this whale. Um, and so behind me, you can see two cranky boxes. The one up above, the black and white one has paper doors. That's what I use when I travel and perform, which obviously I didn't do much of this year. Um, and it's been interesting because the year before we, we toured the Northeast and we performed in Arizona and California and did workshops and shows. And then since last February, we've been here in Baltimore. So that's been interesting. Um, just figuring out new things, new ways to do things, teaching workshops and making videos to show online like the video you just saw. Um, and I've been teaching workshops how to make these tiny little crankies to just kind of give people something to, a creative project to do at home. So that's been fun too. And then I ended up helping organize this um, miniature cranky festival where we got people from all over the world to share their small crankies they made at home. Um, and this, this is what I perform with now when I perform live, like when we were doing our street shows. Um, and it's designed after um, a Chinese the doors are designed after a Chinese form of street performance. And I, I do want to give a shout out and acknowledge that everything I do originates in Asian culture, basically, <laughs> as far as shadow puppetry and paper cutting. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think I chose to make these doors inspired by Chinese street performance doors. Um, I think in Japan and China, they have this form of street performance where it's in a box, but they slide images in. Um, and this cranky is actually the cranky that um, I brought with me and performed at my um, fireside share at VCCA last time I was there. Um, so this one's based on a ballad and it's about a woman named Elizabeth Whitmore. Um, and I guess I, I'd also share, I've been doing lots of different stories, like this, I did a collaboration with the horse cart vendors, African-American horse cart vendors in Baltimore. Um, and this is a, pretty recent collaboration I did with some Inuit throat singers who live in Northern Quebec. That's an image from that one. And this is a one I did for Kentucky Public Television that's based on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of what I do. Is that short enough, Q? <laughs> Great. Um, so cool. It's, it's, um, I, I love that we're doing a fireplace series and the cranky right next to you 
just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy. Yeah, it's a fire, like it's just, doesn't it? Like it's 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 so evocative, and I, I'm reminded of. Um, <clears throat> I know you talked about Asian culture, but I'm reminded of. I went to a gamelan concert one time, and they do a lot of like shadow puppets thing, and, and some things remind me of that too. And it also oh, reminds yeah. me that we all we all do the very best we can to to have a voice and do our own thing and but we have to all acknowledge it's derivative we're all we're always borrowing from different things musically you know it's like i there it's an amalgamation of the things that that excite you and now i want to go to baltimore now even more than ever baltimore is a great place and, <laughs> and it's very lucky to have you there mm, thank you so much mm -hmm. I think I missed a little bit of something because my uh, internet connection went out, but we're back, right? <laughs> this is real, right? <laughs> I think we're back. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I guess I will introduce our next wonderful person. There she is. Maggie. Um, everyone meet Maggie Smith. Maggie Smith uh, is the author of five books, including Keep Moving, Good Bones, and a new collection of poems, Goldenrod, forthcoming from One Signal, Simon & Schuster, in July 2021. That's awesome. Her poems and essays have appeared in the New York Times, Poetry, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and The Paris Review. And Maggie is going to read some poems from her third book, Good Bones, which were directly inspired by Catherine Fahey's artwork, plus some new poems. So introduce yourself and say hello to the people. <laughs> Thank you, Q. Hello. Um, really what I want to do now is just sit here and watch Kathy um, perform Crankies. <laughs> but I guess I have to do something. Um, I have to say, the, the I only spent nine days at VCCA in November of 2011. And those days were so uh, important in my work. I was working on what ended up being my, um, I guess it was my second book of poems that I was working on at that time. And I remember going to a studio visit in Kathy's studio and sitting in the front row with a little plastic cup of red wine. And she had, um, asked a couple of other poets. I know Sally was one of them and there was someone else who were helping her out and doing the shadow puppets behind the cranky while she sang and cranked, um, cranked the scroll through the box. And I remember sitting in that dark room and watching her perform this cranky and hearing her sing and going up to her afterwards and saying, something like if I had ever made anything that beautiful, I could stop making things altogether. Like I just, I was completely entranced by what she had done. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was just absolutely beautiful. And so I went back to my studio that night and I wrote um, this poem, which is uh, in my third book, Good Bones. And then I started writing a bunch of other poems, all sort of loosely inspired by this cranky. And at some point, Kathy sent me some uh, historical information about Elizabeth Whitmore, who the, the ballad is based on. She was an actual woman. And I didn't read it because I didn't want to feel um, wedded to the actual story. I wanted to just be able to go off in my own imagination and, and make up the story myself. So I thought I'd read a few of the poems um, in Good Bones that were um, inspired by sitting in that room um, and watching Kathy perform. And then I'll read just a couple poems from, from Goldenrod, the, the new book. So you'll notice um, when I read these poems, um, you'll notice that there are references throughout some of them about um, paper cutting and shadows. And that's um, sort of an homage to what uh, the magic that, that she works. So this is the one that I wrote in my studio, um, the first one in the, in the series, and it's called Marked. They are alone, the woman and the girl. 
The man has gone over the mountain to work for a year, maybe longer, and the sunlight here is a little bitter, the color of turmeric, the same gold as the leaves floating down. The girl has an eye like a spyglass for birds. She must be marked, the woman thinks. Wherever she walks, the shadow of a hawk falls on her the way a light trains on something. In this thick forest, light can't touch every leaf, but the woman watches wind touch all of them. If they weren't paper thin, this rustling would be a hammering like hooves on hard ground. The man will return, but what a strange homecoming to the world belonging to the woman and child. They cut its intricate shapes from nothing, like silhouettes from paper. They have a rhythm, mornings to the creek on horseback, ochre leaves falling through ochre air, nearly indistinguishable. Evenings at the fire, telling stories the man won't know. Maybe there is something about his hands, rough as bark, the girl will remember. But if she's grown wild in this wilderness, who could blame her? Once small enough to fit inside the hawk's fallen shadow, now she can almost outrun it, the dark blade of a wingtip scissoring across her face. All right, so I've just dog-eared a few of these. So the hawk is a character that's not actually in the cranky. Um, the cranky has a woman and a little girl and a husband who, who goes away to work. Um, and there are some hunters that show up, but mainly the cranky is the woman and the girl. But I invented this character of a hawk who sort of watches over um, the daughter. And this poem's called The Hawk. The hawk has never seen a girl. This new creature, smaller than a fawn, song unlike a bird's, hushes the air with her gold hair. The clearing seems an invitation to light her, but the hawk has no light to shine, only shadow. He hovers, training his own dark double on the girl. They are tethered, an invisible string between them. She rarely speaks, but sings, the hawk has never seen notes shaped like hers, each one an empty locket with space inside it, but for what? This is not for birds to understand. The hawk loves the girl best in the open, only sunlight strumming the tether between them, her notes rising easily to him, the way an echo homes to the voice that calls it. Now, if I remember correctly, the song that Kathy sings when she performs the Elizabeth Whitmore Cranky, it's this a cappella song. And I swear she said something during that studio visit about it being something called shape singing, which I don't know anything about, but that idea lodged in me, which is where um, the line, the hawk has never seen notes shaped like hers. Um, comes from. So it was just a little scrap of something she said that I picked up and, and kind of ran with as metaphor. Uh, this poem I wrote about arriving at VCCA. And when I got there, I wrote this poem as myself in first person. And then as I started working on the cranky poems, um, I call them the hawk and girl poems, I ended up recasting this poem in the perspective of the woman of Elizabeth Whitmore. So now um, it's in third person, but really this is what it was like in some ways for me to arrive um, on the mountain in, in November of 2011. It's called the story of the mountain. Home is not what the woman had imagined. Late fall, the fields are cropped to stubble, the mountain already rust and smoke. The trees must have flamed here, but she's too late. The man has threaded himself through the trees on their best black horse, and a hawk has dropped its shadow on the girl and won't lift it away. The girl is learning to read the world, and every turned page reveals something peculiar, wholly new. In the story of the mountain, the trees burn for as long as they can bear it. 
The horizon blurs and wobbles like a heat mirage. The woman doesn't know how the story ends. Like the mountain, it has a shape, but she's too close to see it whole. Just that idea of like when you're really close to something, you can't, um, you can't quite see it for what it is. And then I'll read one more of the of the cranky poems. This one um, has a lot of cutting in it. It's called Storybook. Elsewhere in this world, there's water you cannot see beyond, the hunters say, and seabirds. The men say the ocean is not so far from here, and the more they say it, the more the girl smells salt on the piney air. Elsewhere in this world is water you cannot cross on horseback or raft, but here is all tinder and leaves, all paper like a book cracked open on its spine, and these mountains, this intricate forest cut from its pages. The girl wonders if this is what the crows have been doing with their sharp cries, cutting leaf shapes from paper, cutting their own shadows to throw down, cutting the hawks so it can follow her. She wonders if when a baby is born on the mountain, a caw cuts the child's shape from flesh too. The girl could be elsewhere in this world, but here she has a long dark girl to lie down beside. So those are from Good Bones. Um, which came out in 2017. And I had just started writing the poems that would be part of this book in 2011 um, when I was at BCCA. Um, Goldenrod, this is the galley, um, the uncorrected for early version um, is the book that'll be out in July. And um, I'll just read a couple poems from this one and then we can chit chat, if that sounds okay. I think I'll read the, the title poem, uh, Goldenrod, which uh, is kind of a road trip poem. It's uh, a poem that I drafted on a legal pad in the passenger seat <laughs> while someone else was driving me through uh, Illinois. Um, I find that I do a lot of writing in the car um, or once did when one was able to travel. And it's kind of funny the way I describe riding in a car and looking out the window. It's kind of like a film strip rolls by. And it occurred to me tonight that it's also kind of like paper being scrolled through a cranky. But I like writing from the car because I get to watch things go by and sort of catch the imagery as it streams past me. So this is Goldenrod. I'm no botanist. If you're the color of sulfur and growing at the roadside, you're goldenrod. You don't care what I call you, whatever you were born as, you don't know your own name. But driving near Peoria, the sky pink orange, the sun bobbing at the horizon, I see everything is what it is, exactly in spite of the words I use. Black cows, barns falling in on themselves, you, Dear flowers born with a highway view, forgive me if I've mistaken you. Goldenrod, whatever your name is, you are with your own kind. Look, the meadow is a mirror full of you, your reflection repeating. Whatever you are, I see you, wild yellow, and I would let you name me. Maybe I'll just read one more. I um, didn't do a lot of writing um, during the pandemic. I did a lot of parenting and a lot of crying and a lot of roller skating um, and a lot of walking around with music blasting in my comically oversized headphones. Um, but I did do a little bit of writing. So there are a few poems in Goldenrod that um, I wrote in 2020. And this is one of them. Uh, I think the, the title sets it up fairly well. <laughs> it's called, During Lockdown, I Let the Dog Sleep in My Bed Again. Last night, my daughter cried at bedtime. Of loneliness, she said. She's seen the graph, the jagged mountain we need to press into a meadow. And maybe she pictures the drive home from Southern Ohio, how the green hills flatten without us doing a damn thing. 
no sacrifice required. I tell her the steep peak makes loneliness our work, makes an honorable task of it. But I shut myself in the bathroom and cry hard into a hand towel. I walk alone in the snow, squinting up into the big wet flakes, letting them bathe my face. I tell myself it is a kind of touch. I tell myself it will do. I think I'll stop there. Holy moly. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, can I ask a couple questions? Please. Like, just a couple things occurred to me. Um, so, Maggie, <laughs> you were only at VCCA for nine days. Yeah. And I think we should start calling the arrival at VCCA to arrive on the mountain. I like that expression. <laughs> well, when you live in Ohio and everything is very, very flat, it felt very foreign to me <laughs> to yeah, drive Delaware. like winding up the, yeah. Delaware is the same way. Um, I just have to ask, and I mean, I'm being, I guess this is my job, but I'm, I feel like I'm being selfish because I want to know these things. Um, your first seeing Catherine's work was how long into that nine days? When was your, when was that visit? Maybe I want to say I wrote the poem on a Friday and I don't know why I remember that, which means I probably was at your studio on a Thursday. <laughs> and I don't remember when I arrived, probably on the weekend. So it was maybe five days in. The reason I ask is because having done some residencies, sometimes finding, um, sometimes it takes a few, like several days to get into a groove. And so this angel appears for you <laughs> and and in and and I love this idea of you being inspired and ducking off to work and you know Catherine is is just in the throes of her work too and it's like maybe I don't know if you guys had a great conversation or you just peeped and then you went and did your thing but either way it's a really it's just a really cool um uh the the story somebody should write down that whole the the story of some of that time i'm glad we're doing this it's really cool yeah yeah i don't think we had a long talk that night i mean we hung out a lot and had meals together but i don't remember that night having a long talk i think i was just sort of flabbergasted honestly like i didn't know what to say like i'd never seen anything like that or heard anything like that in my life and i just sort of like stumbled out <laughs> To the darkness back Isn't to my amazing? studio yeah. and just was like i need to process that in like that imagery somehow in language and then i remember mm -hmm. reading at my fireside reading i read that poem or like an early draft of that poem and it just seemed like I just felt, I just remember feeling, and I still feel very, very lucky. Like I was absolutely in the right place at the right time. Because if I had been there a different nine days or mm -hmm. hadn't been there at all and hadn't had that opportunity, I mean, I'm really just so grateful. That's so cool. I remember I was at VCCA and I think she's an artist from uh, New Orleans, Deb Mel. And she does these really, like, if you can imagine, like Mardi Gras inspired and really bright and when you go into someone's studio and you feel like you're stepping into a whole new world that idea yeah. of, uh, of of like i've never this what is this i've uh, it's 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 fantastic that's such a cool um way to be introduced to it and to and to push you in in your creative explorations it's really cool yeah um, i just felt so inspired hearing Maggie's poem and I mean I just felt like I don't know if I told you at the time but I felt like well now I could make a piece of artwork about that poem <laughs> and then like you could write a poem about that <laughs> we could just keep going it's recursive right? yeah right. like it's I just an felt interesting so inspired style, yeah. by what Maggie um, wrote I had the, the the shape singing what's what's that all about did I imagine that no it, 
I loved that you included that in the okay. poem. Yeah, it's called Shape Note Singing. Shape Note Singing. Shape Note Singing. And it was, it was a way that people taught people to sing in early America, basically, so they could learn to sing so they could sing in church. And that mm. instead of having all round notes on the sheet music like we do now, and I think Sheila also does this. Um, yeah. I shape met some neighbors note, yeah. there near VCCA who do shape note singing and, and I got to go sing with them. Um, but basically, yeah, the, the notes are like diamonds and rectangles and different shapes. I know, exactly. It's like, what? I mean, it's like a poet's dream. Like you go and you watch someone do this and then they say stuff like that and you're just like, what? alternate universe did I end up locking into that I get to be sitting in this room with this right now? Like it, it's just bonkers. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like we, there's no way to have enough time to say enough about VCCA and the things that can happen in a, in a place like that. And, yeah. and um, you know, I have over the years been sometimes invited to music collaborative residencies and things like that. I, I, for one, always prefer, to be in a space where it's like we're not all sharing the same discipline and it's like you just you get inspired more you learn more and i always find that i, I really find especially visual artists are really musically if not musically inclined they're very musically um just like like well read mm. um because of sometimes it's part of the process of painting or whatever and whereas musicians we tend to get sometimes tunnel focused on like I'm trying to perfect the, this way of doing things or something like that and and listening to music would be a distraction but um, speaking yeah. of music it's my segue um, uh, Dana can ask the music credit passed by too quickly could you share again or at least tell us a little bit about the music from your cranky from that cranky that we showed oh my god I'm gonna forget that <laughs> put you on the spot I found that music. It's so beautiful and I'm not gonna remember the name, but I can send it to you. Um, um, it's, I found that music on YouTube. One of the things I've been learning during this time is how to make videos of my pieces. And like, I love collaborating with other musicians, but mm -hmm. that wasn't possible and on YouTube, they have this amazing music library that's copyright free and these generous souls allow people to use their music for their videos. That's where I got that track, which I that's love. Really cool. mm. Yeah, it really fits the, uh, it fits the cranky really well. And uh, uh, Baltimore has a great music scene. I know a it, lot of talented It does, musicians. I'm yeah. really lucky. To have. Um, while we're talking about the cranky, um, Royal Montgomery asked, how do you do the additional puppetry like the cat and the van? Yeah, so um, how do I do it? I, I usually have a puppeteer performing with me like <laughs> now, which used to always be different friends. And when I was at VCCA, I wrangled someone into doing it for oh. me. <laughs> Sue, I think it was Sue Blackwell maybe. And um you know in this one they're they're really tiny the shadow puppets and they're like taped onto rods. Mm -hmm. Like the bus is really, really small, which is like a huge difference between like this puppet <laughs> and this puppet. Big size scale difference. So, so you you enlist help. It's I enlist help. You're not utilizing your your feet or anything to do any extra <laughs> movement of the. No, I mean <laughs> every once in a while I'll perform one by myself, but it's really like I'm frantically running around, and I when I'm if I'm behind the box puppeteering, it's hard for people to hear me narrating, and I really I love telling stories and singing mm -hmm. stories, and I think. I think that comes from like a deep desire to wish that I was a better writer. And I think that's part of why I was so honored by Maggie writing mm -hmm. the, those poems. It's like, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, if I was a writer, I would wanna be her. Like that was so amazing. And 
And it, I just want to say it was incredible to get to hear Maggie read those poems. I've never gotten to hear her reading them. Wow. It was amazing. It was such a gift. Thank you. Um, and here we are this, 10 years later. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this just in the music from the cranky is Morning Dove played by Zachariah Hickman. Thank you. So see, uh, we're team here. We get stuff done. Yes. <laughs> we make up for each other's, you know, forgetfulness and things like that. Um, no, I, I really think it's like, like, yeah, you guys are coming almost on your 10, 10 year anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. It's this incredible. Fall. And I feel like there was like this amazing convergence because I don't know why you picked the hawks. Like, did you, my email is called two hawks, two fishes. I have a thing about hawks and crows and I don't think you even knew that. About I did me. not. <laughs> and it just, I like it would be reading these poems and I'd be like, who is this person like channeling <laughs> everything I love? How does she do that? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Just, um, it's kismet, I suppose. Well, I remember being there that, that week too and watching, speaking of music, watching a music video that you did for Y Oak. Oh yeah. The fish. The fish. That is but that was all aquatic. Gorgeous. Like that, mm. that music video was just bonkers and then i came back from that and i just would send your links out to people like i was at vcca and look at what this person's doing like someone does this like this is art that someone does so um i just have to say sheila just said it's time to come back <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Let's, let's just, let's just okay but see here's the thing we'll have to plan it so that we can do it at the same time oh my god that I would be incredible that. Honestly, yeah. that would be so incredible. I would in a string, heartbeat. Some strings, strings pulled on that one. Yeah, I, I will, um, I'll, I'll happily puppeteer. Oh boy! <laughs> I'll, I'll pour the wine into plastic cups. I will <laughs> drink it. Okay. Um, I will drink it too. <laughs> Robert Minu, Minu, Minukachi, that's the best I can do. Um, uh, asks, you mentioned a partnership you did with horse cart vendors in Baltimore. Could you talk about it, please? Yes. So this is pretty wild. So Baltimore is the only city in the U.S. to still have horse cart vendors. And I live, so I live kind of in the ghetto and <laughs> My block, instead of a lot of Baltimore has alleys behind it, my block has a courtyard kind of in the middle of it. And in the middle of that courtyard, there is a horse paddock. And on the other side of, of the horse paddock, there is a horse stable that's back there that's been there since the 1800s. And what happened was a lot of um, African-American people who are freed slaves came to Baltimore and were trying to find their way and find work. And a lot of them ended up being horse cart vendors. And um, so they could be their own boss. And this is a picture from that cranky. And they mm -hmm. still have these beautiful red carts with yellow tops and they dress up their horses with these beautiful feathers and bells and it's, it's a Baltimore tradition. It's mainly African American. And um, they have these beautiful ways that they sing the names of the produce that when they go down the street. So you hear them singing and you hear the bells and you see the horses all dressed up, you know, and it's, it's just such a lovely thing. And anyone who has grown up in this city knows them and it is a part of them like and the story that i tell is my friend robin reed's memories of growing up in the city um and she's african-american and um i actually met her in new york she was my boss when i lived in new york but she moved back here um and they're her memories she has mm -hmm. covid right now so please send mm -hmm. her your thoughts. She's recovering, but she's wow. She's what had a, a hard year. Story. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to go from that to something pretty, pretty light, I guess, because I want to, if there happen to be nearby, I want to see the comically oversized headphones. <laughs> they're no, they're not nearby. They're in my kitchen charging. No, um, I just have, you know, like giant, like Bose noise canceling headphone, Bluetooth headphones that I listen to when I walk everywhere. Um, and I have a tiny noggin. So like even completely contracted on the top, they're still way too big. And I sort of look like a cartoon character. But if you live in my neighborhood and you see me, it's like the introvert's dream because I can leave my house just to go pick up my kids from school or go to the bank or do walk the dog. And if I'm wearing these, I don't have to have a conversation with anyone. I can just kind of smile and wave. And, it, and it's like this bubble that I'm in where I can put on any music as loud as I want. And I'm sort of like, it's a conversation free zone. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to try that sometime. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. But I, I like, you talked about that in your description of like what you were, what you worked on or didn't work on over the course of the year. And I think that's, you know, that's probably a conversation for another, another time, but you know, it's been, um, it's been a challenging year for so many people. And if, if, if we've all been lucky enough to get through without getting sick, mm. um, so many people have lost their lives, but I think for artists, it's been this whole, um, this challenge of, well, should this be the most creative time of my life? Like, you know, it's, and, and like I've dealt with issues with how come I'm not being more prolific? How come I'm not getting more done? And now that for me, the, the gigs are coming back, how do I even do a gig anymore? Yeah. It's like playing for people is such a different release than playing and practicing at home or doing a, certainly doing a live stream. And, um, but um, I'll try to tie some things into this, the fact that we're able to do this and that VCCA has done this, this is the 21st episode. Um, so um, it's, I don't, I don't know if we hadn't been through what we've been through, if this conversation wouldn't be happening in this way and getting out to people. And mm -hmm. I'm certainly really, for, I feel fortunate that I got to meet you two here virtually and I hope I'll see you somewhere in Virginia or somewhere. Um, I don't have any more questions. Oh, does Maggie have a Spotify playlist? What is her favorite artist? Ooh, uh, I have lots of Spotify playlists. Um, I don't have a favorite artist. Um, that's that's like asking if I have a favorite poet. Right. Um, but I am listening to music all the time. Like I don't, I don't really do anything without it. I don't write without it. I don't cook without it. I don't. I don't walk my dog without it. I pretty much am listening to it. Right. Unless I'm doing this, I've got music playing. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think left to your own devices, the two of you would talk the rest of the night through. We totally <laughs> would. Yeah. We totally would. I just um, want to say, follow Maggie on Instagram. You will not regret it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that, but thank you. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Um, <laughs> I want to make sure we thank Kim Doty behind the scenes for making making this work and cracking jokes with me in the private in the, in the private <laughs> conversation, um, and uh, for Sheila Pleasance at VCCA and every everybody who makes VCCA uh, happen and work and and we're all so excited for VCCA to reopen to people in July, mm -hmm. and um, because I I for one it's I can't imagine my life without it. It's my first residency was in 2005 and, and it, it really changed my life and, and how appreciated you feel and how, how it stands as an institution to help foster your creativity with, with no, with no bounds and for two amazing people to meet and grow and learn and, and create off each other. How cool is that? So I just want to thank everybody and everybody everywhere in the world. <laughs> Period. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> and I guess with that, it's good night. <laughs>